Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest podcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. And today we're going to be talking about uh, some of DNA and, and what we've learned about it since 1953. Uh, these two old geezers that you see here are indeed uh, James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, standing in front of their um, original model that they constructed in 1953. Uh, and of course, uh, the world did not stop in 1953. They certainly uh uh, changed and our knowledge of the DNA molecule uh, has changed quite a bit since then uh, has grown and expanded quite a lot and we're going to start looking at that uh, today with this process called replication so this is a good point to update your table of contents update your notebook and here we go uh, first of all let's kind of take a minute and ponder what we have learned I'll put all of the, the things that we've learned about DNA so far. Well, first of all, uh, people learned that chromosomes carry hereditary, or, or that is to say, genetic information. Uh, we learned about that all the way back, going all the way back uh, to the earliest days that we learned about with Gregor Mendel and some of those early pioneers. Uh, we know that chromosomes are made of DNA and protein. Okay, so we know that there's some protein in there. Um, and we know that genes, whatever those are, are also on chromosomes and that they're made of DNA. Um, so if this is true, then why do our chromosomes have protein in them? Why isn't there just DNA? That would have certainly, uh, people would have discovered a lot, an awful a lot sooner. Uh, and then how is DNA able to copy itself? That's the real question right because in order to have offspring that pass on traits we've got to somehow be able to this molecule has to be able to make a copy of itself how is the genetic information coded um, and what exactly is a gene when we say a gene what exactly are we talking about um, and as we see over and over and over again in science new knowledge doesn't really it does answer some questions but it always raises more questions than it answers this this we see all the time. Okay, let's look at chromosome structure first of all, and this will clear up a couple of these. Um, chromosomes are very tightly wound uh, molecules of, of DNA. So this is our DNA uh, double, double helix, uh, and it is wound around these, uh, th these little spools, uh, and then those are wound around, and that, and that whole thing again gets coiled again, and that gets double coiled again into this thing that we call a chromosome. Um, so the little spools that we see here are made of protein, and those are called histones. Uh, and the thing, when people examined chromosomes and they found that there was both protein and DNA in there, the, the protein turned out to be these little histones, and these are just sort of uh, like little spools that sort of help to organize uh, the DNA molecule and protect it. So that answers one uh, little mystery, but let's look at this DNA molecule a little more closely. We know that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, ribose is a five carbon sugar. This is the same root of the word ribosome, right? Ribosomes are made, uh, when people discovered them, they found that they were also made of this ribose stuff and we'll see what those are uh, very soon. Deoxy means it's missing an oxygen uh, and so the, when we talk about ribose, the ribose molecule that's in DNA, uh, it's a deoxyribose meaning it's a it's short one oxygen. It's a weak acid from the nucleus uh, and we know that DNA is made of monomers called nucleotides. Well a nucleotide uh, has three parts. All the nucleotides have three parts. First, it has a phosphate. Uh, the phosphate forms the backbone uh, or uh, the spiral of the double helix. Uh, there is also a five carbon sugar, which in this case is deoxyribose. Uh, and then there is a nitrogenous base, and those bases are the A, C, G, and Ts. Okay, so let's look at uh, what this looks like. So here's our phosphate. Uh, this is the same phosphates that are in, uh, of, of course, in ATP and ADP. 
uh, our, phos our five carbon sugar, which is deoxyribose. This is the, the, the carbon that is missing an oxygen. This is the second carbon, C2. Um, that, that one is missing an oxygen. And then a nitrogenous base, which is either an A, a G, a C, or a T. Okay. Uh, when we put that all together, we have a, uh, a DNA nucleotide. Okay, so that's what the DNA nucleotide looks like. Okay, the bases, uh, as we've already said, are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And if we remember Shargaff's rules, uh, Shargaff, who is very important in helping uh, Watson and Crick make their discovery, well, we know that the amount of A is equal to T, which is to say that A and T uh, form a, a hydrogen bond. This is a very weak bond that we'll see in just a minute is very important. Uh, so A binds with T, C binds with G. Okay, so these two things here are able to uh, connect together uh, and, and those are the, the, the basis of Shargaff's rules. Okay, so here's a, a question. If a sample of DNA has 30% adenine, how much cytosine should be present? Okay, so I'll give you just a second to ponder that, so I'll let you think about that. So are you ready for the answer? Okay, well, I'll take that as a yes. Well, the solution is since we know that A is equal to T, and we said that A was 30%, well, that means that there has to also be 30% thymine. All right, well, if we put those two together, that accounts for 60% of our total, okay? So that means that C and G together must make 40%. Well, if those two together make 40%, since C is equal to G, guanine must be 20%, and cytosine must also be 20%. So that means that there would be 20% cytosine. If you were able to figure that out, give a big old Lisa Simpson fist pump and uh, pat yourself on the back. Uh, incidentally, you can expect to see uh, questions like that uh, on some tests and quizzes in the near future. Okay, another important thing about the DNA molecule is that the strands are anti-parallel. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you look at this, you'll see that the ones on this side, uh, on this, this half of the double helix are going in one direction. The ones on this half are moving in the other direction. Okay. There are some very important chemical reasons for that that we're not going to go into. But uh, the end effect is that they are, they, you, you could think of it as uh, two halves of a two-lane road. One of them goes in one direction, one strand goes in one direction, the other strand uh, is red and constructed in the other direction. Okay, so we know that the general genetic material is DNA. Uh, but this still hasn't answered our, qu our question, our central question. How is this passed on to the next generation? How is it copied? How are cells able to make copies of this very, very, very long molecule? Okay, so the, uh, if we again go back to Watson and Crick, uh, this very famous sentence was in their, uh, their 1953 paper where they say it's not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a po possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Okay, well, they call this the semi-conservative model. Okay, and what that means, that is not a political statement. What that means is that um, half of the uh, genetic information is conserved. When it copies itself, half of it is conserved. Half of it is new material. Okay, so let's... Um, what this this is uh, an idea presented by them. Half of the uh, one half was a template, uh, which was served as a template for a new complementary strand. Okay, so our new DNA, our new double strand consists of one of the original strands plus one new strand. Okay, so our, here's our parental strand, uh, and then as you can see for our new copies. Uh, this half acts as a, as a template, and this half also acts as a template. So now we end up with two uh, complementary pairs, or two, I'm sorry, two identical double strands uh, from the original. Okay, how does this work? Well, first of all, the, new, the, the two strands have to separate. 
okay? And then the second thing that happens is that those are the, uh, those two original strands are template for our new strands. Well, what's that look like? Well, uh, we just construct these things, as we can see, in opposite directions, since it's a, they, they are anti-parallel. Uh, and so once this process is complete, we now have two identical copies to the original. Okay, so each half acts as a template for a new double strand. Okay, since an average chromosome has about 130 million base pairs, well, this doesn't happen all at once. So if this is our parental strand, uh, what has to happen is that it has to sort of split uh, one base pair at a time. Okay, uh, and this region where this happens is called the replication fork. Uh, and we have two enzymes that are largely responsible for this happening. Uh, the two enzymes are called helicase and DNA polymerase. Helicase is the enzyme that uncoils and separates the original strands. And then DNA polymerase is the thing that brings in the new nucleotides, bonds them together, uh, proofreads to make sure that everything is happening correctly, uh, and then creates that new double strand. Okay, helicase and DNA polymerase are the, uh, the enzymes largely responsible. So the enzyme helicase unwinds and separates the two uh, parent uh, strands, breaks those very weak hydrogen bonds, and then DNA polymerase is able to then come in uh, and use that template. That's the enzyme that uh, uh, uses the original template to form the new, uh, the new uh, complementary strand. Well, obviously this has to happen before a cell can divide. Okay, so um, again, just as we've seen before, this is our parent DNA molecule. Uh, this region here is called the replication fork. Um, it splits off, uh, and then our new, uh, new daughter strands are formed uh, which are complementary, uses those each of those halves as a template. Just to give you a little idea of what we're talking about, these are the enzymes. These are both obviously themselves proteins. Uh, and then the DNA polymerase um, and, the D and the helicase enzymes, uh, this is what they look like. Obviously, these are very complex proteins. Uh, and uh, again, we see another example here uh, of the, the very com complex protein structure that's possible and we're going to be seeing uh, very soon how these proteins um, are made. Okay, one final question. Uh, if we have a one, if we know one DNA strand, if we know one uh, sequence, then we should be able to figure out what the complementary strand is. Okay, so think about this just a little bit. I hope this isn't too much of a strain for you. Uh, you should be able to figure this out pretty easily. The answer, if we start off with CGT, ATG, well then the complementary strand uh, is going to be GCATAC. Again, we see this example where C goes with G, G goes with C, A goes with T, T goes with A, A goes with T, C goes with G. So once you know those very simple base pairing rules, um, problems like this are really no problem at all. Okay, this is where I'm going to hold it up. Uh, this has been uh, vodcast number 20 for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School, uh, and I will be seeing you soon.